All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to the fourth lecture of the quarter. So we are still continuing to talk about waves and different properties of waves, but we're gonna start doing a little bit of a different approach and start talking about mostly light and looking at mostly um, representation of light that has to do with direction. So let's just um, kind of quickly review different ways that we have been representing waves so far. So we started with a wave equation and what the wave equation did for us is kind of fully describe the behavior of the wave. So in the wave equation itself, we knew about the period of the wave, the wavelength, direction, phase constant, and total phase, and so on. Um, then we reduced the wave equation to another type of representation, the wavefront representation. And that was useful to kind of visually see how waves um, emanate out from the source. And it also helped us understand about wave interference and specifically was very useful when we looked at the double slit experiment. So this wavefront representation, but when we go from the wave equation to the wavefront representation, we lose some information there. So what does the wavefront tell us? The wavefront is mostly telling us about um, the wavelength, the dimensionality, and I'll, I'll get into that shortly. Um, and then we get some idea of direction uh, by looking at the total phase and, and which way the total phase is increasing. Now, rays um, is what we're going to start focusing on from now on, because what rays tell us is about direction. And we're going to start looking at um, waves reflecting uh, of surfaces, or next lecture, we're going to look at waves actually going from one medium to another and what happens there. So what we'll care mostly about is the direction um, of our wave. So what are exactly rays? Um, again, it's just a, a different representation of, of your wave. Um, they originate from the source as do wavefronts. Um, and what rays do is they point in the direction of the wave traveling. So it turns out that the rays are always going to be perpendicular to wavefronts. Why? Because there can be a component of velocity which is uh, parallel to the wavefront. The wavefront describes how the wave kind of moves out from the source. So the rays have to be perpendicular, but then Careful, rays themselves are not vectors. Vectors are some uh, quantities that always point in one specific direction. These rays, as we'll see, they will be able to bend um, and change direction. Okay, so here's kind of um, how we would go from a wavefront picture to the ray picture. So remember, just let's recall the, uh, these circles are representing our wavefronts where the red ones are let's say crests and the blue ones are trot. So when we draw rays, we draw them perpendicular to these wavefronts and the rays uh, represent the direction uh, of the wave traveling. <clears throat> Another thing actually rays tells us about is they indirectly give us some at least qualitative information about intensity of light. So, and how is that encoded by the density of rays? So if we look at two equal areas, this red and the blue area, we see that the density of rays or the number of rays in the blue area, i uh, sorry, in the red area, um, so the number of rays per that unit area compared to the blue one is bigger in the red area. So that tells us that the intensity is larger and how do we know it's larger? Well, we are closer. I mean, why, why is it larger? Because we're closer to the source. So the intensity decreases um, because intensity, remember, is energy per unit area. So as the wave spreads out over a larger area, the intensity goes down. So the rays tell us that indirectly. Um, so again, rays tell us 
direction. They also tell us about dimensionality of the wave. So if the rays are parallel like this, then the wave fronts, remember, have to be perpendicular and that describes your one dimensional plane waves. Where if we go back, here you see the rays are not uh, parallel to each other. So this is our two dimensional wave front. And of course you can imagine instead of circles having spherical shells that would be that would describe you know more realistic for example sound wave which is emanating from a speaker in all three dimensions so you would have rays coming out and into the page uh, but one information that you do lose going from the wavefront picture which are the parallel lines to the arrows the rays is that you no longer have any information about wavelength so here just to kind of prove that point here are two different wave fronts represented with different wavelengths the wavelength here is longer than here but the rays look identical because the rays just tell you that uh, the direction of travel is perpendicular but for the type of physics that we're going to be looking at or the type of behavior of waves specifically light that we will focus on we don't really need at least at this point to have any information about wavelength. So it will be sufficient for us to just look at rays. Okay, so we start with, um, so what we're gonna focus on today is trying to see how light reflects off surfaces and specifically how that explains to us how mirrors make images. So the reason why we see images uh, inside mirrors is due to light reflection but we're going to look at uh, at this in great detail so um, to explain how light reflects we start with this Fermat's principle and what he stated back in the 17th century is that the path taken by light ray between two points is the one that takes the least time so this is a rather intuitive idea if you uh, picture point A and B, and you think about which path will light take to get from point A to B, it's kind of intuitive that it's gonna take uh, the path which is the shortest path between the two points, which is the purple path here, the straight line, rather than have this zigzag um, crooked path or like the blue one there. So, you know, this is quite intuitive, but actually, um, this Fermat's principle explains to us exactly how light reflects off surfaces. So if you think about um, the shortest path to get from A to B, but for a ray that has to first reflect off a surface, so imagine this black line represents such um, a reflective surface, then you could think about all these multiple ways like this light blue one or the green one or the red one that this uh, ray may reflect to get from point A to B. But if we follow Fermat's principle and look for the shortest path, I'm not gonna get into this here, but with some geometry you can prove that the shortest path would be like the red path here in such a way that these two angles that the incoming ray and the reflected ray make with the surface are the same. So then um, we arrive at what is known as the law of reflection. So the only difference between this picture and what I showed in the previous slide is that how we measure the angle. So in, as you will see, um, when we look at this bending of light either due to reflection or what will be known as refraction that we'll discuss next time, we always measure angles relative to what is known as the normal. So what is the normal? It's basically the line that is perpendicular to our surface. So whether the light ray is reflect, uh, reflecting or refracting, but today we're just focusing on reflection. So basically you find your surface, this black line, and you draw um, here, I drew this dashed line, a line that's perpendicular, and that is known as the normal. So the angles, how you measure it, you measure it relative or from that normal to the ray. So this is known as the angle of incidence because this is the ray that's coming in. So that's why there's a theta and we use theta for angles and there's a subscript I for incident. 
and then this ray reflects and this angle measured from the normal to the ray which is the reflected ray is known as the angle of reflection that's theta r and the law of reflection based on Fermat's principle tells us that these two angles must be the same Again, a pretty simple idea, but this, is, this idea is exactly what's going to help us understand how mirrors make images, which is the topic for the rest of today's lecture. All right, so let's start with our simple plain mirror, which you look in um, every morning when you wake up. Um, so how do we figure out exactly why this mirror makes the image that we're used to seeing? Well, the way um, just a couple of conventions I need to mention. So the way we normally um, do this is we define some kind of object. So ob the object is the, the physical object. Um, and then the image is what we see in the mirror. So we often use something like an upright arrow, which you see here. And why did we do that? Because we want to distinguish between it being upright and upside down. So that tells us orientation. If we just um, had like a, a straight line up here, then we wouldn't really be able to tell whether the image has inverted or not. As, and as we will see later, there are some mirrors which will invert images. So, and we use these rays here to represent how um, the light travels. So if we have some object and it's in a light room or that object itself, let's say it could be a candle or a light bulb, but let's just picture a more standard scenario of you standing in front of the mirror. So the arrow is you and there's light in the room. This light hits you and then it bounces off you in all directions. So you imagine there's infinite number of rays which are emanating from this object. So what happens, not all the rays will hit the mirror, but some will. So the ones that do, for example, this one, you can use the law of reflection. You can draw a normal um, to this plane mirror and figure out that the reflected ray will be that one. <clears throat> this is an interesting one, the one that goes straight perpendicular to the mirror well, what is that angle of incidence? It's zero because there's no angle between the normal and the mirror. So what that tells you is that that ray is gonna be just reflected straight back. And there's you know, one more here that's drawn. But in reality, again, there's infinite number of these rays. Now, um, imagine actually, so, all right, so this is not, the object is not you, but it's some object sitting in front of the mirror here. And then you're standing behind it. So here's your eye. So what does your eye see? Well, it sees the actual object in front of the mirror, but it also sees all these reflected rays. So imagine this eye is kind of far away and all these reflected rays, they hit the eye as well. Now your brain doesn't know anything about the fact that this light bend at some point. So how does your brain interpret those light rays? it interprets it as if they all travel in a straight line. So if we take these reflected rays and we kind of trace them back, so we take this one. So these dashed lines now behind the mirror, they know, they're no longer representing actual physical rays. There's no light behind the mirror, but what they're representing is where you think or your eye thinks these light rays appear to be coming from. So as we see, if we trace all of them back, at least the three reflected ones that I have chosen to draw, they all seem to meet at one point. So they start from the tip. So your eye interprets as if all these light rays are actually originated over here in the back of the mirror, and that's exactly where that tip of the arrow is. You could do the same kind of ray uh, drawing from the middle of, of this arrow, and you would find that all of those reflected rays will appear to you as, they're, as if they're coming from that point. So basically, what you're seeing is this image, which is behind the mirror, 
And if you do some geometry, it actually turns out to be that the distance from the mirror to the object is the same as the distance from the mirror to the image. Now this is known, and we're gonna get more into this later, but this is known as a virtual image. Why is that? Because what makes up this image is not real light. There's nothing physical going on behind the mirror. It's black behind there. It's, it's just what appears to you to be that, um, that image. It's what you think those light rays are coming from. So this is gonna be an important distinction because sometimes actually mirrors will make real images. So we'll see what that means shortly. All right. So plane mirrors are interesting and they're more common in your everyday experience, but even kind of more interesting from a physics point of view are what are known as spherical mirrors. So spherical mirrors have this kind of spherical-like shape. So there's an example of one type, which is known as a concave mirror. So what's on the left of the mirror here is, um, is the light that's gonna be reflected. So you imagine that there's, this is a mirror, it only has one reflected, reflecting surface on this side. So a good way to remember this concave, it's, it's as if this, is, this shape is like a cave. All right. So let's think about how light reflects of this shape of mirror. Okay, so let's just start with one ray. Um, and how would we apply our law of reflection here? Well, you draw this normal. You take kind of a tangent line here to this mirror and draw a line that is perpendicular. And then you would measure this angles. And then you see, okay, this lay, ray reflects like that. And you keep on going with a bunch of parallel light. So here, we're, what we're assuming is there's some very distant source of light. And remember, when our sources are distant, the wave fronts become parallel, so then the rays become parallel. So it turns into a one-dimensional light wave. So these parallel light rays come in, and they reflect. And again, you know, you apply your law of reflection on that side, and you can keep on going. And if you kept on going with many, many rays, what you would find is they all kind of seem to meet or converge to this one particular point right there. So that particular point is a special point for this spherical mirror, and it is known as the focal point. As its name implies, it's where parallel rays focus when they're reflected off this uh, concave mirror. Mm. Um, so again, it's defined here to be the point through which all horizontal incident rays are approximately reflected. If you have a perfectly spherical shape, then it will be exactly reflected to that focal point. And that point is going to be important to us when we try to figure out what type of images this type of mirror will make. Okay, so there's other important properties of these mirrors that we need to define. So the focal point, we just defined it's F, but what's more important is the distance, because we'll use this distance to do some calculations later. So the distance from the focal point to the mirror is known as the focal length of this mirror, and we use little f for that. Then there's also the center of the mirror. So the center of the mirror is the same thing as the center of a circle. It just means that if you draw a line from the center to the mirror, all those lines will be the same distance known as a radius. And here it's known as the radius of curvature because you know it's not a circle, it's just, it just has this curvature here. So the center itself is the point, but the distance from the mirror to the center is known as capital R, the radius of curvature. And it turns out there is a relationship between R and F, and R is just double F. So again, this is a geometrical uh, derivation that I won't get into it um, too much here, but this is a property that um, happens to be true for these spherical mirrors, which again will be useful. <clears throat> All right, so now let's think about 
how we would figure out, now we're no longer concerned with parallel light rays coming into this mirror, but some object which is nearby, so you're standing here in front of this mirror, what kind of image are you going to see? Well, one way to do this is take a protractor, draw a bunch of random rays, measure the incident angle, make sure the reflected angle is the same, and do it for a couple until you see where they meet. And that will tell you the image. But since we already have defined these very special points, they will help us kind of make it easier on us. So let's see. Let's think about a ray first that's going to come from the tip of this area and go parallel. Well, we already know what's going to happen to that ray. It's going to go through the focal point. Why? Because we just defined that's the exact definition of the focal point. It's where all the rays that are parallel. Um, so, one thing I guess I haven't defined yet this dashed line is what is known as the optical axis of the mirror. So it's something like you kind of draw in the middle and then you measure everything relative to that. So anything basically parallel to this optical axis, any ray would, would um, reflect through this focal point. So this is known as a principal ray. So we're gonna define three principal rays. So it's basically rays you can think of principal rays are just rays that are easy to draw once we have defined our focal point and our center. There's, in reality, there's infinite number of rays that are present, but normally if we can figure out where three lines cross to find our image, that should be enough to kind of convince ourselves that, okay, all other rays will go there as well. So this is um, the first principal ray. Now, what about another one? Well, think of a ray that goes through the focal point. How is it going to reflect? Well, it's going to reflect parallel, um, parallel again to the optical axis. Why is that? Well, law of reflection is completely reverse, reversible. If this ray was coming in this way, how would it reflect through the focal point? So if you go backwards, it, it will have the same type of behavior because it doesn't matter which one is the incident or reflected angle, the two have to be the same. So the second principal ray, again, a ray that goes through the focal point reflects parallel. And then what could be our third one? Well, we have this special point, which is the center of the mirror. So if we take a ray that goes through the center, by definition, like when you draw a circle and then you draw from the center to, um, to the circle, that radius will hit the mirror or your circle perpendicular. So basically the line that goes through the center hits the mirror perpendicular. And what does that tell us? That tells us that the incident angle is zero. So the reflected angle has to be zero too. So that means that the reflected ray has to reflect exactly in the same direction. So you just draw the line back. So that's your third principal ray. And as we're seeing here, there's this special point where these rays are meeting. Uh, are meeting. They're all going to um, converge to that point. And in fact, if you were to draw another ray that's not principal ray, you should find that it goes exactly through that point. So what are we seeing is, remember, we're just looking at rays that come from the tip of this arrow. That means that the tip of this arrow will be right there, the image of that. Remember, that's the actual physical object. And what we're looking for is the image. Where are those rays, the reflected rays meeting? So if we draw our image, now we see that the tip is over here. And in fact, if we kept on doing this and we did principal rays or other rays from the center of this arrow, we would find that it's, they would meet up here. And from the bottom, the, the bottoms have to meet on the same line. So what we see here is that the image is actually upside down. It's inverted compared to the object. It's also closer to the mirror than the object. And one thing that's different about this image compared to the image plane, uh, made by the plane 
um, mirror is that it's actual physical rays. They actually exist physically um, right there at this point that are making that image. So unlike in the plane mirror, which we saw made virtual images, these, this particular image is known as a real image. So let's see what are kind of the definitions of real images. So what makes an image real is that it's actual physical rays that meet at the point where the image is formed. How could we prove that an image is um, real? Well, you can put a screen, you know, a piece of paper or a screen at the location of the image and those light rays would reflect off the screen so you could actually project that image on a screen. You could not project a virtual image on the screen because there's nothing physical to project. There would be no light rays that would reflect. Um, another interesting thing that we observed with this real image, if we go back a step, is that it's upside down, it's inverted, and it's in front of the mirror. So that's um, so we see that the image is on the same side of the mirror as the original object and the imager is inverted. So these are the properties of real images made by this concave mirror. Now let's see if this same concave mirror can make a different type of image. Let's put our object a little bit closer to the mirror than before. So remember in the original ray tracing, um, we had our object to, I think, the left of uh, C, so somewhere over here, and now we have it in between the mirror and the focal point. So how do we apply our three principal rays to figure out the image made um, by this object, which is located here? All right, so here's our first principal ray. It goes parallel to the mirror, it reflects through the focal point. Now, remember our second principal ray before our object was over here. So we'd have to like go through the focal point and then reflect parallel. Well, it, here you're already closer than the focal point. So you can't go through the focal point and hit the mirror, but we can um, use a ray, which is it's as if it's coming from the focal point. So this dashed line is not actual physical ray. It starts from the tip but it has to line up with a focal point. Um, again, this is just geometry, because remember any parallel ray has to reflect through the fo focal point, but now we're just doing it backwards. So it's the ray that is lined up with a focal point, hitting the mirror is reflecting back parallel. And then our third principal ray is the ray that would go through the center, but again, it's a ray that lined up with the tip and the center just reflects exactly in that same direction because that ray hits the mirror perpendicular. So these three rays, as you see, they are the reflected rays, but there's no place they're meeting. So how do we find if there's an image or, what, or you know, where is the image? Because if you can imagine like if you kept on extending these, they're just diverging from each other. They're getting kind of farther and farther apart. And there's not a point that we can see on the left of the mirror where these rays would actually physically intersect. Um, and when we're looking for the image, we're looking exactly where those rays physically intersect. But if we take these rays, so again, remember, uh, imagine putting your eye somewhere here in front of the mirror and you take these rays and you actually trace them back behind the mirror. So these dashed lines here behind the mirror are no longer representing physical rays, that's why they're dashed, but they're the projection of these rays back to that point. So again, it's as if you think by looking at these rays, because you just think that they travel in straight lines, so you think that they're actually all coming from that point. You, you think that that's kind of the, the source of that image. So what you're seeing now is that tip behind the tip of the arrow, behind that mirror at that location. And again, if you did this for the middle of the arrow, you would find it here. 
and so on. So this time, this is a virtual image, kind of like what our plane mirror gave us because it's not composed of physical rays. It's a virtual image. It's also right side up. It's no longer inverted like it was for the real image. And another interesting thing that we see is that the blue arrow is taller than the red arrow. So it's also magnified. So there are these properties that we're going to look at when we, it comes to images. We're going to think about whether image is real or virtual. We're going to think about whether it's right side up or inverted. And we're going to think about whether it's magnified or demagnified. So these are going to be important properties of mirrors, of images. Okay, so then this is our image and it's virtual and that's, let's again just summarize what a virtual image um, is. It's when rays do not physically meet, but they're kind of projected to that point. So it's only the lines extending to the, they're ex extending the reflected rays backwards intersect. So this image cannot be projected on the screen. If you put a screen there, there's no physical light rays that would actually reflect off that screen. Now, another thing that we notice for this particular concave mirror is that this image, the virtual image is gonna be always on the opposite side of the mirror compared to the object. And the image is the same side up as the original object. So it's not inverted. So we, we just saw that depending on where the object is positioned, Concave mirrors can make either real or virtual images, which is quite interesting property of these mirrors. Now let's look at another type of mirror. This is known as the convex mirror. I guess, again, it just has to do with the shape. So instead of kind of curving in, it curves out. So now this side is the reflecting side. That's where we put the reflecting material, not inside here. So all the light that comes in from that side is gonna be what's gonna be reflected of this mirror. So um, as before, we start with some distant source, which sends out um, when we get close to the mirror, just parallel light rays. And I've just drawn two here. And we can apply our law of reflection. And what we see with this shape that the rays that are reflected, so there's one here and one here, are not going to intersect. So if you can imagine drawing a couple of more, what you see is this light rays actually diverge from each other. So if you look on this side of the mirror, there's no uh, equivalent of a focal point, one place where those rays meet. But if you project or if you extend these rays backwards behind the mirror, they will all meet at one point. So this is known as the focal point, which is not a physical focal point, how it was for concave mirrors, but this is the focal point of convex mirrors. And like the concave mirrors, convex mirrors also have a center with the same relationship that the radius of curvature is twice the focal length. And the focal length, again, here is the distance from the mirror to the focal point of this convex mirror. So let's think about what type of images do convex mirrors make. <clears throat> so let's put our object here and let's think about how to define principal rays. So there's the one that comes in parallel. How does it have to reflect? It has to reflect away from that focal point. Then there is the ray that would be going towards the focal point. So it's kind of like this one backwards. You know, if there was a parallel one, it would reflect away from the focal point. Now it's um, going backwards. So from the tip towards the focal point. So you kind of line up the tip with the focal point and you draw a ray that way. That one has to reflect parallel. So we have two. And it's always helpful to have at least three to really convince yourselves where they would meet. So the third one was very similar to the concave mirror one, the array that's lined up with the center. So if you line up, like you would, you were gonna use um, rulers here quite a bit when you do ray tracing with mirrors. So you line up the tip with the center, you draw that line. So the solid lines, remember all these are the ones that are physical rays. This is just helping us 
see how to line that up. So because it's lined up with the center, and that ray is perpendicular to the mirror, so it reflects right back. And what do we, we see? We see now here are these three rays, and you should think about, will they make a real image? And the answer is no, because it does not look like these rays could possibly intersect somewhere. But as we did before, um, what we can do is we can take these light rays and extend them behind the mirror. And if we do that, we see, oh, indeed, they do all meet at one point, which is right there. So the image of your tip of your arrow is right here behind the mirror. What kind of image it is? Is it? It's virtual. It's not physical rays that are making it. It's again upright like it was the vir for virtual images for concave mirrors, but this time it's demagnified. The blue arrow is shorter in height than the red arrow. So actually the image appears to be smaller than the actual physical object. And it turns out that these convex mirrors will only make virtual images. And this really just comes from the physical shape of this mirror because what this mirror does, it always diverges light. This light will always, uh, the reflected light will diverge, so we'll never meet or intersect on the same side as the mirror. It can only project images uh, behind the mirror. So these, this type of mirror will only make virtual images. So this is again our image and it's right side up on the other side of the mirror and smaller than the object. All right, so here's a question for you to think about. Um, so we have this convex mirror and what I'm showing you here is this red arrow and I'm saying that's an image formed by this mirror. And what I'm asking you to think about is which one of these choices, A through E, is the object which is giving you this image. So think about this. <clears throat> okay, so let's try to eliminate a couple of them. So first, remember when images are virtual, when they're on the other side of the mirror, they have to be the same orientation as the object. They are not inverted. So that takes A and B out. Because if A and B were the objects, then your red arrow would have to be facing upwards. But we can have an upside down object. So if this object is upside down, then the image has to be upside down. So it's between C, D, and E. But how do we figure out which one is it? Well, we have to kind of do ray tracing backwards a little bit. So I think one ray that could sort of, I would start with at least, is the one that's lined up with the center. So we know that there's one ray that has to project to the image that comes towards the center and reflects back. So there has to be basically a ray that would line up the image, the object, and the center. And if you extend that line, so again, when you're going through this, I think having a ruler, kind of putting a ruler to the screen might help. So again, if you draw a straight line through the center focal point and the object, the only possible object that makes sense is this object D. This object could never line up or this one, it's too far, that ray would never hit it. And then you can also check the other principal ray. So there's the one, this one that lines up with a focal point and reflects parallel. If we project it back, yes, it meets this tip or the one that's parallel, and then the reflected ray is lined up with a focal point, again, goes to the tip. So, you know, it's just to check, but I think just the central ray uh, tracing was kind of enough to tell us that D is indeed has to be the answer for the object. <clears throat> okay, uh, this is kind of a fun, more conceptual uh, question to, um, make you think why would you why would we ever use a mirror like this? So remember this is um, here ray tracing showing an object and a convex mirror which is making this virtual image. So why do you think what's a good application for this type of mirror? 
So we have a makeup or shaving mirror. We have a wide angle mirror, photography. I think these mirrors are used in photography or perhaps the human eye uses mirrors to interpret light um, or mirror-like objects, um, biological objects, of course. And then a mirror in a clothing store dressing room. So where do you think this is applicable? So I think it'll be fun to answer this by kind of eliminating the wrong answers. So makeup or shaving mirror. So normally um, when you're shaving or putting on the makeup, you want to magnify yourself. You want to see details on your face. And this actually does the opposite. So it makes images which are smaller. So the images um, demagnified. So that's not very useful for a makeup mirror. Now photography, what is photography? Well, it's taking in light and then it's projecting it. We want a physical real image that comes, that appears. Um, so here we have virtual images. There's nothing you can do with virtual images. You cannot project that light. And this, the same thing with human eye. Um, the human eye is something that takes in light through the eye and then projects it on the retina and then your brain interprets that physical light. Um, so this setup is definitely not the way the human eye works. And in fact, we know that light has to go through the eye and yet make a real image, but we saw that with mirrors, the only type of real images that are made are in front of the mirror. So clearly our eyes are not mirrors. There's something else and that's subject for our um, next lecture next week. So when we talk about lenses, what we will see that lenses in fact make real images, but they make them behind the lens. So that's coming up. All right, a mirror in a clothing store, dressing room. Well, normally when you are trying on stuff, you kind of want to see reality. So you don't want to see yourself either bigger or smaller than you are in real life. So we use plain mirrors for that. So the only one that kind of makes sense here is a wide angle mirror. So what, what is that? Well, first of all, what you see is that you see an image which is smaller than the object. So what does that tell you? It tells you that because the images are smaller, you can get more of your objects in the mirror. So, you know, because the images are smaller, convex mirrors reflect from wider angles. They take more in um, from wider angles. So these are really good for security and things like that to see what's behind the corner. <clears throat> uh, let's look at some other applications of mirrors. So, you know, we, talk, we mentioned makeup or shaving mirrors. For those, you want your image to be magnified. Um, we saw that convex mirrors don't magnify images, they demagnify them, but a concave mirror with the object which is close to the mirror does magnify that object. So this is useful for the makeup mirrors. But as you see, the object has to be close with the mirror. So if you have one of these mirrors, you can kind of play around with it at home and see what happens as you move the mirror away or when you move your face away from that mirror remember what happened when we had objects farther away then we would get a real image so you would you should see kind of an image which appears to be coming from in front of the mirror versus behind and you should also see yourself appearing upside down so if you have one of these i um, suggest you play it around with it because if, if you know if you were in real deal this quarter you would get to play with these big mirrors. Um, and then another um, application of a convex mirror, like the wide angle mirror, is um, the types of mirrors that are used in cars to be able to see behind. So again, we want a reduced image. Um, we don't want to see things upside down. So we want it demagnified, upright, and smaller. So that's where convex mirrors are helpful. Um, what are another application of concave mirrors? So remember, concave mirrors, they focus real light and they focus to a certain, to a certain point. So if your goal is to collect some signal, 
or some light coming from far away, you can make a shape, a reflecting shape like this. So this is some kind of detector satellite. Um, if all this parallel light comes in, you know, if you just had a detector sitting there, well, it, it, it can only collect so much of that intensity. So remember, the more um, area, the bigger area you have, the bigger is the intensity of the signal. So the stronger the signal would be. So if this is your detector, and if you didn't have a reflecting surface, it was just coming to the detector, then you would have to build maybe a very large detector to detect enough of a signal. But to make your life simpler, what you can do is you can make this reflecting surface, which has a concave shape, and all that parallel light would come in and reflect back to the focal point. So if you build your detector exactly, or if you place your detector exactly at the location of the focal point of this particular geometry, then you're not just gathering light that hits the detector directly, but you're also gathering the signal from that hits the entire dish here. So this is exactly why these um, satellites have this particular shape to intensify the, the signal coming in. Um, and then kind of the opposite of that is if you want to create a light source that is very directional it's in one direction so you know for example a light bulb um, in your house you want that light to be uniform you don't want to necessarily shine just on one part but if you're using a bike light or headlight of your car you don't want to waste that light to go everywhere you want it to point directly straight so what can you do well you can put your little light bulb let's say right here, and have a reflecting surface right here that has a concave shape. So all that light, then that hits, and if you also, you need to put that light bulb at the focal point. So what does that tell you? That all that light that hits the surface will reflect parallel. It's kind of the opposite of the source that's coming in parallel and reflecting to the light bulb. Now we have a source, at the light bulb, all that light is gonna be reflected back parallel, so you get this uh, headlight type of lighting where you have a directional uh, source of light. So if you look inside, if you have a bike light, you can take a look inside, what you should see is that there's a mirror inside there, or you know, this is like a headlight of a car. And that's the exact reason to give you that type of light source. <clears throat> All right, so kind of to summarize what we have discovered um, about these mirrors, and remember, where did we start? We started with Fermat's very simple principle of the way light travels, it always takes the shortest path. That gave us the law of reflection, and from law of reflection, we are able to look at all these different sh reflecting surfaces that have funky shapes, um, the spherical mirrors and figure out what type of images we get. So we saw that for concave images, uh, we get two types, uh, or for concave mirrors, we get two types of images. If your object is out here, we found we would get an inverted real image. If your object was close to the mirror, we get an upright magnified virtual image. Now convex mirrors, and you know, it's not like we looked at all the cases, but you could do that. You can move this around and you would always find that you get a smaller image than the object. It's demagnified, it's always virtual, and thus it's always upright and on the other side of the mirror. So, you know, doing all this ray tracing is fun. Um, you know, taking rulers and measuring focal points and centers, but if you really want it to be specific, like you wanted to know exactly how bigger is my image or where exactly is my image, doing ray tracing could be fine, but you would have to be very careful in drawing it and measuring it. Um, it's better to have some equation to do that for you so you can be exact. And we do have an equation for that. And video is gets in the way. Mm. Um, 
This is known as the mirror equation. So it's a pretty simple equation which connects uh, the important quantities that relate images, objects, and focal lengths. So let's take a look at this. So it's one over F. What is F? It's the focal length of the mirror equals to one over I, I think I must have them marked here. Yeah, so one over I, what is I? That's the distance from the mirror to the image. It's the image distance plus one over O, which is the object distance. So it's always the um, distance from the mirror to the object. Now the interesting thing, whether you're talking about concave or convex mirrors, the same equation applies, but you have to be a little bit careful because there are some sign conventions. So these sign conventions are just basically things that you'll have to memorize, but as you play with these equations, you will see that you know, those signs make sense as you, you know, get your results and figure out where the images are and so on. So the sign of F is always positive if it's a concave mirror. If it's a convex mirror, F is negative. So here we have a convex mirror. You measure this distance, I'd say two centimeters, but because it's a convex, the F is minus two centimeters. Object distances, those are always positive quantities, but image distances can be positive or negative. So images that are on the same side of the mirror as the objects, so remember like if we just have um, that one concave mirror, we, would, we found image was on the same side as object, then I is positive. If the image is on the other side of the mirror, making a virtual image, I is negative. So when image is on the opposite side of the mirror, it's negative. So, you know, as you um, work with these, this equation, you're gonna get more used to it. But for now, this slide is a really good one to refer to. And then when it comes to you preparing for a quiz or the exams coming up, you know, this is something that's gonna be nice to, to have with you. And in fact, this equation, so next lecture, as I've already alluded to it, is gonna be all about lenses. And it turns out that this same exact equation will apply to lenses, so which is pretty cool. So you'll really need to learn one or two equations for the next couple of weeks as we look at mirrors and lenses. So this is really known as the mirror lens equation. But there's one more equation uh, we care about because all this equation tells us is that given some focal uh, length of a particular mirror and given some location where we put the object, where does our image appear? And we'll also see if we get an eye, which is positive, that means that our image is real. If an eye is negative, it means our image is virtual. Mm. But another thing that we've been always talking about um, is not only where the image is, but how big is it compared to the object? So that is known as the magnification. So we also have an equation for that, <coughs> magnification equation. And what is magnification physically? It's just the ratio of the height of the image to the height of the object. So when M is bigger than one, or the magnitude of M is bigger than one, I will actually write these things in two because that's important. Um, that means that the height of the image is more than the height of the object, so your object is magnified. The image is bigger. When this is, the absolute value of this is, and I'm saying absolute value because this quantity can be negative or positive and I'll talk about that shortly. So when the absolute value of this is less than one, that means height of image is smaller than the height of object and um, the image is demagnified, it's shrunk, the object appears to be shrunken. So that's kind of what you could do just by doing ray tracing, taking a ruler, measuring this height and this height and taking the ratio. But to be more exact, you can actually use this equation to find, you know, object distance is something that's given. You place an object somewhere, you can find the image distance. And it turns out the magnification can be find, found directly from those values. It's minus I over O. Now let's think about the significance of this minus. So remember when 
images are virtual, so when they're on this side of uh, the object, of the mirror, the I is negative. So if we look at this equation, when I is negative, minus I becomes positive, so M is positive. So what is the meaning of having a positive magnification? It's when the image is right side up, so it's not inverted. When it's negative for real images, the I is positive, so you get a negative magnification and you have an upside down image. And the way this makes sense here, so remember an upside down image would be something that would be like pointing down from here. So you measure your height relative to this optical axis. So everything measuring up is positive H, everything measuring down is negative H. So the ratio would be negative. Where here for, for your virtual image, upright image, they're both positive, both pointing up. So the ratio would be positive. <clears throat> Or if they were both originally, if this was inverted, it would be negative, but then the image would be also negative, so we still get a positive magnification. So there are a couple of things to keep in mind here. The actual magnitude of M tells you about whether the image is bigger or smaller, but the sign tells you whether it's right side up or upside down. And I'll add here a note on my slides about the magnitude. <clears throat> All right, so this is a magnification equation. And also we will see when we talk about lenses, the same exact magnification equation applies. So really you will only need to know those two equations. All right, here is a clicker question. So you, we've already kind of know the answer because we've seen it, but I want you to think about how using these equations we can answer that. So remember, this is our concave mirror. And I'm asking you what type of images does it make? Does it always make a real image? Does it always make a virtual image? So we already saw that it depends, right? When we put, put our object here, it was real. When we put it very close to the mirror, it was virtual. And then it gives you kind of more details. Um, we'll make a real image only if O is bigger than F. So if your object is on the left of F, or it will make a real image only when O is less than F, somewhere over here. And that's not true because we saw when we put it here, it's virtual. So just from kind of seeing it before, we know the answer, but let's think about how this equation tells us the answer. And then it says we'll only make a virtual image when the object is at the focal point. Well, that's not true either. All right, so let's think about how we can use this equation to answer that. Well, um, we're looking for real images. So when the image is real, remember, I has to be positive. We're talking about concave mirror. For concave mirror, F is positive. So what does that tell us? That O is positive too. So if we solve for I, uh, one over I, so we move this on the uh, left side of the equation, we get one over F minus one over O. And we're looking for a real image, right? So then the one over i has to be positive, so this difference has to be positive. And for this difference to be positive, this quantity has to be bigger than this quantity, but it's inverted, so that tells us that o has to be bigger than f in such a way that one over o is smaller. So O bigger than F, what does that tell us? That the object has to be on the left of the focal point. So this rule we basically derive directly from this equation that tells us that when we have a concave mirror, it will make a real image when your object is to the left of the focal point. And then you can use, follow the same argument if you're looking for when I is negative, I is negative as virtual image, then we have to make this difference negative. And then that's true when O is less than F. O is less than F, that means when our object is in between the mirror and the focal point, we will get a virtual image. And here's just kind of a reminder to, of the sign conventions. And at home, I suggest that you prove using very similar arguments as I did here, why convex mirrors will only make virtual images, why you can only get a negative eye. So I think I am done for today. Uh, thanks for listening and
I will see you next time. Bye.